So shell scripting is a term we use when we say, write a bunch of commands, put it in a file and have them executed one after another with your shell. That's literally all it is. We know how to execute commands in our shell by running them, right? Echo hello, echo goodbye. I can't type obviously. And we know how to run commands in our shell. Great. What happens when you want to run a lot of commands and that kind of do like a similar logical thing? You're going to have to run them one by one in your shell and potentially typo them all the time. No, you will put those commands in what's called a shell script and you'll run that entire file as a series of commands. What does that really mean? Let's look. Let's create a shell script. I'll call a new file called test.sh. The .sh actually doesn't mean anything. The extension is just for us humans to know that this is a shell script. Shell scripts have a standardized format. The very first thing at the top of the file should be what's called the shebang. And the shebang just stands for hash, bang, and then the full path to the interpreter that you want to use to interpret the commands within this file. So if I did echo hello, echo goodbye, and then ls slash temp, I'm telling this shell script, you have three commands. All three commands should be put through the bash interpreter to be evaluated and executed. Let's save and quit that file and let's run it. So we do test.sh, you'll see, hey, you can't run this file because it's not executable. So let's actually ex make this file executable by running chmod plus x to give it execute permissions. Run it again and you'll see that the file was executed. It ran hello, it ran goodbye, and it ran the ls slash temp. So all those commands that were in my shell script were executed in linear order. There you go. That's literally shell scripting, taking commands from your terminal, from your shell, putting them into a file and having them run all linearly. But I don't really like the term shell scripting so much because shell scripting means scripting for a shell. So if we look at the, the file again, we see that the interpreter we gave it was a shell right? Bash just happens to be a shell. I could have done like the born shell. I could have done Z shell. I could have even done fish shell. So the interpreter here matters, right? They're all technically shells. So these are shell scripts, but whatever interpreter I put up here, I have to use the syntax of the language that it expects, right? I couldn't start writing like, you know, go code in here, right? Like funk main or whatever. I couldn't start running go code in here because this is going to go through the bash interpreter and I'm just going to like give it syntax errors. So whatever interpreter you put at the top of your file, that is the script. That is the, the interpreter your commands are going to go through. And that's why I don't like those term shell scripting because it's basically just a term that says your interpreter is a shell, but your interpreter can be more than just a shell. It can be a programming language interpreter like Python. So let's put the, a new, uh, let's create a new script called test.py and let's tell it to use the Python interpreter now from, or let's say hello from Python. So now I've created a new script that's not a shell script, but it's a Python script. Why is it a Python script? Because the interpreter that I put at the top is Python. Let's run this. So again, chmod, and then let me put this to the top test.py boom. Hello from Python. How do I really know that that's actually going to Python though? Well, let's mess up this command and put a bogus command here, run it again. Boom. Trace back from Python. So that script was executed through Python, but my shell script was executed through bash. So be careful with the terminology. Generally speaking, when people say shell scripting, they mean a script that's targeted through a shell interpreter. And then other, other times they will say like scripting to just be general. And you just have to check the interpreter that you're using. Okay, cool. Let's actually build like a, a little small CLI tool to better understand shell scripts and their functionality. Now, what I want to do is I want to download a product from HashiCorp's releases website, right? Maybe it's Terraform that I want to download or Nomad or some, some command that I want to run on my system. And I want to download it from here. What I would normally do is I'd go to this location. 
click the product I want to go to, click the version I want, and then find my OS and architecture that I want to download. I'd like copy this link, go back to my terminal, run a curl command to download this, this file, right? Then I'd like unzip this file to the location I want. And then I'd have Terraform like on my system, right? I have to run these commands again and again and again, but I could actually write a shell script to do this for me. And better yet, I can write a shell script to download any command that I want. What does that look like? Well, I already have one written. So I have HCDL uh, final, and I'll show you what this looks like. So if I ran this and did Terraform 173, this shell script takes two arguments, the product that I want to download and the version, and it reaches out to releases.hashcorp.com and downloads the product to my to a location on my path. And now if I ran Terraform version, you'll see that it's 173. But if I went and went and I downloaded 175 again and ran Terraform version again, it's 175. So this is a little handy shell script that I've written to make my life a little bit easier. And it would work with other products too, right? Like let's say I want to download, I don't know, Nomad 171 or something, right? I've downloaded Nomad, ran Nomad version, and now I have 171. So this has made my life a lot easier because it's easier to remember to run this command than it is to run the curl command and then the unzip command and so on and so forth. So I've put this in a shell script for my ease of use. Let's build it. Let's build it from scratch. Even though I have the finalized source code, I'm going to go piece by piece. So very first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to create some shell script file to hold your script. I called mine hcdl.sh, and it just stands for HashiCorp download.sh, right? Whatever, short and sweet, straight to the point. Again, very first thing you're, you're always going to want to do is make sure your interpreter is set in your shell script. And since I'm going to be writing a bash script, I'm going to put bin bash up there in my shebang line, my interpreter line. Then the first thing I want to show you is declaring a function. So if you want to declare a function in this shell script, in this bash script, this is the syntax you use. You give it the name, open parentheses, open braces, and then a body. Okay, so that's what this, this function does. And I'm creating this function called usage to print out how I want this shell script to be used. So that if a user like interacts with my shell script incorrectly, I can print the usage to them so they can see how to do it correctly. You'll notice that I'm using a syntax here with a dollar sign curly brace. This is a variable syntax. So I'm getting the variable zero, like whatever value of variable zero is, I'm getting that. So what really is that? Well, if I did something like this, HEDL final Terraform 175, the zero value here holds the arguments that were called on the command line. So it looked something like this. And if you don't know what this means, check out my other video on the shell to understand like arguments and parameters on the, on the command line. But when I run this on the command line, the very first token, I guess you can call it, that I run or argument is going to be stored in the zero var variable, the next one in the one, the next one in the two, and so on and so forth. So if I wanted to access them in my shell script, I call them like this. And this just basically helps me get the name of the shell script I'm executing. That's all I'm using it for. Cool. So with that, I want to make sure that anyone that calls my shell script passes two arguments, right? I don't care if they pass more because I'll ignore them, but they have to pass at least two arguments. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use this if conditional to check that. Now this if syntax is very finicky. So very, pay, pay close attention to what I'm going to say when I cover it. You start an if conditional using the if keyword, then you put a space, then you put an open square bracket, then you put a space. This space right here is super important because if you don't put the space here, it will have a syntax error. Then you have the conditional, right? So I'm doing the, this is a variable that I'm accessing, which I'll come back to in a second. The minus LT stands for less than, 
It's a, it's a urinary operator to do a test. And then the two on the right hand side is a literal two. So I'm saying if the number of arguments is less than two, then print out the usage and exit one. That's how you read this. And as you already heard, this number variable here is another special variable in bash. And it prints the number of arguments that was passed to my program, excluding the zeroth argument. Cool. So this is just me enforcing passing arguments. Let's see what that looks like. Let's do DL. Let's not, let's not pass any arguments. It prints out the usage and it exits with the exit code of one. If I just do one argument, still prints it out. But if I do two arguments, it's fine. So cool. I'm enforcing people to call my function or to call my shell script the correct way. Now, what do we need? We need the product that we want to download, the version that we want to download, the operating system that we're coming from, and the architecture, right? Because if I go back to the URL, the full URL here, if I grab this, copy link, right? Or sorry, I want AMD64. Copy link. The full URL here is technically this, right? This is the full um, URL that I would need to get. And we have a base URL here, the product, the version, the product, the version, the operating system, and the architecture. So we need these four pieces of information for our shell script to go out and download this. Let's get it. So the very first thing we need to do is get the product. So I'm going to open up this part of the code and explain it. So I'm going to create a new function here called valid product. And all it's going to do is it's going to take a product as an argument and check whether or not the product is one of these valid products that we want to download. The only reason why I'm doing this is because technically speaking, this URL here, this releases.hashcorp.com has like many, many products that you can download, but I don't want my, my shell script to support all of these products. I want to limit it just to a few that I care about. Why? Because some of these products might actually have a slightly different syntax of how you download them. And I don't want people to call it and get errors. Cool. So the new syntax, let's explain some of the new syntax that we're seeing here. One is the local keyword. This local keyword is creating a new variable called product and assigning it to the first argument that's passed to the valid product function. What does that look like? If I were to call this function, I'd call it something like this valid product terraform. So this would be the function call and this would be the dollar sign one for the function. That's what that would look like. And this dollar sign one is going to hold the value terraform in that case, assign it to the local variable called product. And all local means here is that this variable is local to this function. So it's scoped only to this function. Great. Then I'm taking that product that was passed in and I'm comparing it in a case statement. So a case statement is think of it as a switch statement in probably every other language you've worked with. And you're just like switching on the product and you're saying, Hey, if the product is Terraform or Nomad or Vault or Packer return zero, which means return a zero exit code. Zero means success when a function returns in bash. Otherwise, if it's anything else return one, which is non zero. And that means error. And then the case is um, closed with ESAC, which is this case spelled backwards. And I didn't say it before, but if statements are closed with fee, which is if spelled backwards. So you'll see that a lot in bash. We don't have like begin and end, like maybe something else would, but we, we close our, our blocks with like the, the backwards version of the word, which is kind of wacky, but whatever. So now that I have that function declared, I can pull the product from the command line. Remember? So like this up here, I'm going to bring this down. I'm going to pull this product from the command line, right? So take the product, which is Terraform in this case, put it into this global variable called product, and then call a valid product passing in that product that I got and seeing if I have a, a valid product. Okay. This is a new if syntax that you probably haven't seen before. And all this means is call the function valid product passing in one argument coming from the product variable 
if that function returns non-zero, right? That's what this little bang here. So if, if it's not successful, then go into this block and execute this, this, this statement. So this is a way to do kind of like basic error handling in shell scripting. Now, you might be saying, hey, Matt, there's other ways to do error handling. You can do like set dash E and have it handled automatically, blah, blah, blah. Sure, you can, but there's some caveats there. And I would challenge you to go research those caveats. I choose to not use that set E and I choose to do it more this way. So the syntax here looks like if the call to valid product returned a non-zero exit code, then print this out and exit. And this exit one here is a global exit of the whole shell script. Whereas this return one here is just returning from the function call. Cool. Now that we have that wired up, we should be able to run it. And if we pass it a bogus product, like, I don't know, terror form or something, right? It's error form one, seven, five, one, seven, five. You said, boom, unsupported product terror form. But if I did, if I changed it back and I said terra form, right, instead of terror, terror form, then it does not error out and everyone's happy. Cool. We are, we're getting there. Cool. So now that I have the product, I need the version of the product that I want to download. That one's simple. I'm just going to pull that straight out of, I'm going to bring this down with us too. I'm going to pull that straight out of the command line argument and store it right in a global variable. I'm not going to check whether the version is valid. I'm not going to do anything. No, I don't care. This function is meant, this shell script is meant to be simple and for learning purposes. So we're going to keep it very simple and just take the version as is. If the user did happen to give us a bogus version, we would find that out when we go to download it and we get an invalid file. Cool. So that's the version. And now that I have the version and the product, we need the operating system and the architecture. And these are a pair of functions here that look a little big, but they're actually really not that bad. So I will open them up and show you. The first function that we have here is get OS, which gets the operating system. Same pattern as before, local variable call, um, called OS, but this is a new syntax here. This syntax says, hey, run the command inside of this um, dollar sign open parenthesis, run this command inside, and whatever it outputs, store that in the OS variable. This is called command substitution syntax. It'll run the command and substitute its output in this location. And you name dash s, let's take a look at what that looks like. You name dash s prints out the kernel uh, name. So if I ran you name dash dash help, the dash s option gives me the kernel name. And we'll see later the dash m option gives me the machine hardware name, which is going to be the architecture. So we're going to use those commands in our shell script to enforce like getting the operating system and the architecture. Once we run that, that you name command, we'll do another switch statement or another case statement. And we'll say, Hey, did we get a Darwin kernel? Cause if so, we're on Mac OS. Let's echo that back to the user and return success. Or otherwise, did we get a Linux kernel? If so, echo that back to the user and return zero for success. Otherwise, any other kernel that we got, echo it back to the user and return one to signify that we had an error. And then get architecture is exactly the same, but it uses uname dash M to get the machine type. And then it'll do its assertions against different machine types, right? ARM 64 and ARCH 64 are both ARM and AMD 64 and x86 64 are both AMD 64. So we're just doing kind of a little, 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 uh, mapping there. Right? So the same idea. Now, once we have those functions written, we can use them to retrieve the operating system and the architecture. And we're using that same like if syntax where we have if not the command. And this is saying like, if this command returned non zero, then enter this block and exit. So cool. Now we have the OS, we have the product, the version, the OS and the architecture. So with all that information, we can build the URL that we need to build. 
And this syntax is just another variable assignment. I'm creating a new global variable called URL, assigning it this value. And one thing I didn't mention about variables is that this equal sign cannot have spaces around it. It has to, has to, has to have no spaces here. Otherwise, you'll get a syntax error. And all we're doing is creating this variable called URL and assigning it this string. And if you're familiar with format strings or like string substitution, we're just assigning the, we're, we're just substituting the uh, variable values here in the string directly. So we're just building up the final URL. And then we're going to print that to the user. So downloading product from URL. Let's do that. Now that we're at a good stopping point for that, let's see what that looks like. So I will clear my screen and I'll run it again with Terraform 175. You'll see that I was able to get the product, the version, the OS and the architecture. And I built this final URL here, which looks very, very beautiful. Cool, but we're not actually downloading anything yet. We're just, we're just echoing it to the screen. Great, let's go back and take it over the finish line. So now that we've built up the URL that we need, we need to actually go and download it, unzip the file that we got, and then remove the downloaded file to clean up after ourselves. And that's what these last three code blocks do. So here we run the curl command to download the file from the URL that we've, that we've built. We're going to save it to this temp product.zip file. And then all these other options are just like fail silently, silent output, follow links, and then the output file name. So all these other command lines or options are there. Same idea, same syntax, if not curl. So that means if the curl command exits with a non zero exit code, enter this and handle the error. Great. You'll notice here though, I'm not doing anything about the curl HTTP status code that gets returned. So if this curl command resulted in an HTTP like 404 or something, I would not be handling it with this code. So I put a to do item here to check that ourselves and do that later. For the case of this video, I'm not going to go into detail about that. I'll leave it for you as like a homework assignment to, to do that yourself. But you would definitely want to check the HTTP status code here. Because if you did get a 404, you shouldn't try to like unzip some bogus file, right? So just letting you know, but let's assume that everything goes nice. We download the file. Now that we've downloaded that temp.productzip file, we're going to want to extract it. So same thing. We're going to call the unzip command. The dash O says to like overwrite files if they exist. So don't prompt us. Dash D says where you want to extract it to. I want to extract it to this like local bin location because this is on my path and it will make me be able to run the command from anywhere. If you don't know what path is, go check out my other video on the Linux shell to understand that. And we're going to extract this temp um, product zip folder. And inside of that, that zip file, there should be a file called whatever the product's called. We're going to take that single file out. That's all this is doing. And then we just remove the downloaded zip file once we're done. And that's literally the entire thing, right? So if you run it now in its entirety, you'll see that it downloaded. I can do Terraform version, version 175. If I ran it again to do like 170 or something, and I ran Terraform version, ver version, I'm on 170. So it's working. And just to show you a different product, let's do like, I don't know, uh, Nomad, what, 171 or something? I don't know what, there you go, perfect. And I did Nomad version. And I have Nomad 171. So this shell script works. It does what I need to do. It's a nice little tool that I've written for myself to download HashiCorp tools easily. So good job. Let's just recap real quick some of the syntax that we've learned, just so you can like drive it home. We know that a shell script contains a bunch of commands for the interpreter that's specified on the first line. This interpreter is called a shebang or a hash bang because it's a hash symbol and the bang symbol followed by the interpreter path. Whatever this interpreter is, that's the type of syntax you need to use for all your commands. We saw how to declare a function with the bash syntax. We saw how to use variables with the dollar sign curly brace. We saw how to do an if conditional with like a, a test here, right? Like less than or whatever. We saw how to call functions, right? Call usage here. 
We saw how to declare local variables in a function. We saw how to do switch statements or case statements. Uh, one thing I do want to mention about the case statements is if you don't have these semicolons here, the case statement will fall through. So keep the semicolons here unless you want like this case to match and then you like fall through to every case. So just keep that in mind, keep the semicolons there. We learned how to pull create global variables. We learned how to test whether or not a command exited zero or non-zero. And then we learned how to do command substitution by running other commands inside like a variable declaration. Uh, and then the last thing I believe we learned was how to like build a URL with like how to build a string with certain variables inside. So we learned pretty much the P99 of shell scripting syntax you'll need to get started and be successful, right? If you can create variables and do conditionals and do switch statements and all that stuff, you are like kind of an expert on shell scripting automatically just by knowing how to do those things. So I challenge you to like, if you want to play with this a little bit more, do the HTTP status code here, right? Try that as like a, a homework assignment, so to speak, and build up your, your skills there. Or alternatively, you can do something like this, where you extend this script to do like, instead of like a Terraform specific version, you can do latest. And if you see the version latest come through, you can like pull the versions and try to get the latest one, right? You can do something like that if you want to extend it. So those are little like homework assignments you can do to better your skills. Otherwise, you're you're good. You're a shell script the expert now, legit. Like you're you're ready to rock. So yeah, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, leave a comment. Like and subscribe if you like the video, and I will definitely see you in the next one.